Our scripture reading is from John chapter 15. I'd like to just simply read the um, uh, first eight verses. And this is that picture of the vine and the branches, which also tells us something of our relationship with the Lord Jesus. Uh, Jesus speaking to his disciples in the upper room discourse, which you've just finished in our, our midweek study, uh, likens himself to a vine. We are branches and tells us what he wants us to do, which is to bear fruit, and how we are to do it, and that is by abiding in him. Jesus says in the beginning in verse 1, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruits, he prunes it so that, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. And again, we're going to be looking at five pictures, so we're not going to have time to go through everything with a fine-tooth comb. But we do want to, again, see the main things that our Lord has to show us here. Now, I've already mentioned to you that we have been looking at the different images that Jesus uses to describe our relationship with him. Uh, and it tells us really something about that relationship, each one of these images. We first looked at marriage. Uh, Jesus as our husband, uh, loved us, came into the world to rescue us, committed himself to us, took us to be his bride, and as our husband provides for us and protects us, and of course gives us his word in spirit to lead us on the safe paths, as well as to prepare us for that home which he is eventually going to bring us to, as he brings us into his father's house where we will live with him forever. Now, as his bride, as those who are loved by him, he says, or uh, he, well, as Paul reminded us in Ephesians chapter 5, we are to love him in return. We are to be committed to him in the way that he is committed to us, which is fully, and we are faithfully to submit to him as he works in our lives to prepare us for that eternal home, and of course, as he works through us to extend the kingdom, which is what we also saw in the second image of a body. Jesus is our head, and we are the members of his body. As the head, he is the, uh, the one who's in charge. He's the one who calls the shots. He's the one who is the Lord, and he is desiring to work through us as his body to carry out his will in this world. Remember, this is how our Lord completes his work. We, we pray, and of course, we, we ask the Lord to do supernatural things, things that only he can do, but the work that he calls us to do is carried out mainly through the church, through his body, and that then is how he does his work. He, he does it in the same way he did in the book of Acts, working through his disciples, carrying his message as his ambassadors uh, to all men, that they might come to know him. Now, as the members of that uh, same body, there's only one body of Christ, we're also reminded that we are to love one another as, again, members of the body take care of one another, even in our own bodies, uh, we are to love and care for one another in the body of Christ, which we saw included being patient with each other, doing what we can to preserve the unity and peace of the body, strengthening and encouraging one another, and sympathizing with one another by entering into each other's joys and sorrows all so that together we might better be able to do the work that our Lord calls us to do. We need uh, one another, which is why the Lord calls us to become a part of a local church, so that we might uh, be ministered to and minister to others. Now, this evening, 
let's continue the theme by looking at five more pictures of our relationship with the Lord Jesus, as I've told you, that of a vine and its branches, of a shepherd and his sheep, a temple, a lampstand, and a family. Now first, Jesus tells us that our relationship to him is as a vine and its branches, by which he means that he is the source of our spiritual life. And we are the ones through whom he bears fruit. Now again, there are similarities between this and the analogy we saw of a body, and that is that our Lord wants to work through us to advance his kingdom. Uh, these fruits of godliness that he wants to bear through us as branches of the vine lead to this growth, whether it be personal fruits, the, the fruits of the Spirit, or whether it be the fruit of good works. All of these things are meant to build up the kingdom. But I believe here the emphasis is more on the source of the strength that we need in order to do this. Uh, the image of a body reminds us that the head is giving the commands to the body and, and working its will through us, in this case the Lord through us, but here the uh, branches draw strength, draw energy, draw, well, sap from the vine to be able to do, uh, well, to, to bear this fruit that our Lord calls us to draw. As we read in this passage, apart from me, you can do nothing. We don't have the power to do anything that is pleasing to the Lord. We can give the shell of obedience. We can go through the motions of obedience. We can conform to the law of God. The Pharisees did that. But we cannot do it with the right kind of heart. We need the Spirit of God to do that, to do it for His glory and out of love for Him. And we gain that Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ, through our connection to Him. So that's why Jesus tells us that we must abide in Him. If we are not only to bear fruit, but if we are to bear much fruit. He says in John 15, verses 4 and 5, Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Now you, think, you, you would think it would be strange that our Lord Jesus Christ here is, is emphasizing the idea of abiding in a vine because we might suspect that, well, all branches in certain senses are, are abiding in the vine. Uh, what he means by that is remaining in the vine. But he says this because though it may appear that way in many cases, uh, the branches or at least those who profess to believe in the Lord Jesus are not always connected to the Lord Jesus. They may look like they are through their profession and maybe even through their outward lives as they conform to the will of the Lord, but they don't really have his life in them. Uh, he says in verses 6 and 8 of John 15, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And then in verse 8, my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus here is simply reminding us that there are those, that, uh, those branches that appear to be in the Lord Jesus who, again, say they're believers, maybe even have joined with a local church, but really do not know Him. These branches represent false conversions. And the way that we know that they're false is because they are not bearing fruit. They're not bearing the fruit that He desires. He says in verse 8 that Bearing fruit glorifies the Father, but it also proves that we are true disciples when we bear not just some fruit, he says, but much fruit. Further, notice he said that these branches are eventually pruned off, they dry up, they are gathered together, and they are thrown into the fire and burned. Now, that's not the, the fruit of these branches, that is these branches, and these branches represent individuals, and I believe what Jesus is talking about here is what's going to happen on the day of judgment to those branches that aren't abiding in Jesus, who may profess Jesus but really aren't trusting Jesus and aren't bearing that fruit because they don't have the Spirit of God working in them. 
they are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Now, that's not something that will ever happen to any true child of God. Those who are connected to the vine do bear fruit, and they are never cast away from the Lord, as Jesus is going to tell us very clearly in the next picture of the shepherd and his sheep. Abiding in Jesus means there is a real spiritual connection to Jesus, that we have trusted Him to save us. We are looking to Him and Him alone for our salvation, but also that we're looking to Him every day, trying to draw from Him by faith the resources that we need, the spiritual sap from the vine, uh, His Holy Spirit to do what he calls us to do. Remember, if we're believers, we have the Spirit dwelling in us, and he'll never fully leave us by God's grace. But we can be filled to different levels, and the fuller we are with the Spirit of God, the more we're going to be able to, to bear the fruit the Lord wants us to bear, which is why the Apostle Paul commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says if we abide in him, and he in us will not only bear fruit, we will bear much fruit. So we should stop and ask the, the question of how we're doing in this department of fruit bearing as far as personal fruits of, of those um, characteristics that the Spirit of God is working within us of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And how are we doing with those external fruits as far as serving the Lord? Are we bearing fruit? Are we bearing much fruit? We can only do that by abiding in Jesus. If there's no fruit, then you need to look to Jesus to give him your Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit, in order that you might believe if you don't already believe in him. But even as believers, we need to look to the Lord every day to draw strength from him, to draw again that spiritual sap, that work of the Holy Spirit to produce more of that good work that he desires. And by the way, he's not the only one who desires it. We desire it too. We want to be fruit-bearing Christians. We want to honor and give glorify Him. By this, my Father is glorified, Jesus says, that you bear much fruit. Well, if you love the Lord, you certainly want to bear this fruit. Now, notice Jesus further tells us that His Father is also involved in this process. If we are abiding in Christ and we're bearing good fruit, He says the Father will prune us to help us bear more fruit. He says in verses 1 and 2, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Now, we might ask uh, how he does this. Um, sometimes, you know, I think it's represented as perhaps being, bringing trials into our lives and various challenges uh, to help us uh, turn away from our sins and to, um, again, pursue what it is He wants us to do. But I think Jesus actually tells us how He accomplishes this in the next verse because the word for prune and for clean or cleaning are essentially the same in, in, the, in the Greek language. Uh, Jesus says in verse 3, you are already clean, that is, you are already cleansed, you are already pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, if that's the case, then that means that the Father actually does this work of pruning through the word, and actually these two may not necessarily be opposed to one another because we are faced with various challenges every day and decisions we have to make, various trials and difficulties, and we need to navigate through those things by using the word of God which is another reason why we need to be in the words. We need to be in the Word, and the Word needs to be in us before we can do the work that the Lord calls us to do in the way in which He calls us to do it. Do you want to know how to bear good fruit? Then read the Word of God. It tells you what it is you need to get rid of and what it is you need to put on, and as you do that, you bear more of the fruit that He calls you to bear. So here's another encouragement to us to be in the Word. Now, secondly, Jesus tells us that our relationship to him is like that of a shepherd to a sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd, the one who guides us, the one who lays down his life to save us. Now, there are similarities between this picture and the picture of marriage. 
as our husband, Jesus loves us. He leads us and he provides for us. He prepares us for our heavenly home. He is committed to us. And all these things can be said to be true of the good shepherd and his commitment to his sheep. And we as his bride are to love him. We are to be committed to him. We are to submit to his leadership. And certainly the same thing is true of us as his sheep. Now, I think the added element here is, uh, though I, I should say I did mention this under marriage, because as I was pointing out, the difference between how we gain our spouses and how the Lord gained his is that the good shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the one who lays down his life for us. Remember, the hired hand flees because he sees the wolf coming. But Jesus sees the wolf coming, <laughs> Satan. And he had basically his, his uh, arms around us. We were his prisoners. We were bound in our sins. We were in the kingdom of darkness. Jesus knew that. But he came and he, he laid down his life in order to free us from this wolf, that is, from the devil. We read in John 10, verses 11 through 15, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So unlike the hired hand who doesn't care about the sheep but cares for his own skin, our Lord Jesus cares for the sheep, and he lays down his life for us. Now, the evidence that we are the sheep is essentially the same as that in marriage, or the body, or the vine and the branch images, and that is that we follow him. Jesus says in verse 27 of John chapter 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We see the example our Lord Jesus Christ gives us. He's the shepherd who, who leads us, and we follow him. We follow his example. We do his work. We do his will. Now, another very important truth that he gives us here is that because he has laid down his life for us because the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Because he has made a once-for-all payment that covers all of our sins. Because he has obeyed to give us a perfect righteousness in Christ, we are safe for all eternity. If you've ever wondered whether or not somebody who's truly trusting in Jesus is going to be saved to the end and eventually enter into heaven, or if he can fall away in the, in the, mid, or in the middle of the trip, I think th these verses are as clear as you can possibly get in Scripture. He says in verses 28 through 30, And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one." When Jesus made a payment on the cross for our sins and we received that payment through faith in his name, he has washed us of all guilt, past, present, and future. We will make it to heaven. We are saved. He says he gives eternal life to us and we will never perish, nor can anyone take us away from him. Jesus is our good shepherd who will keep us safe forever. Now, thirdly, Jesus represents our relationship to him as a, a temple. We are the temple of God. And Jesus dwells in us. He inhabits us by his Holy Spirit. Paul writes to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now again, marriage, the body, the vine and the branches, all emphasized our union with the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And here we're pictured as a temple in which the Spirit of God actually lives. P. 
Peter represents us. He represents the church, the whole new covenant people of God, not just local fellowships, but all the people of God. So many stones that have been built into a temple to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. He writes in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, And coming to him as as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And again, here we see some similarities with these other images. As his temple, indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we belong to him. And that means a couple of different things. It means, first of all, that belonging to him, he's going to protect us. He's going to protect us in this life. He's going to protect us to the life that is coming. Uh, I thought this was very interesting, how jealous the Lord is over his temple, over his people. How, as the good shepherd won't allow the, you know, the... the uh, the wolf to snatch away any of his sheep, so the Lord will not allow anyone to violate his holy temple. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 17. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Uh, as our husband, he is jealous over us because we are his bride, we are his wife. But as God, he is jealous over us because we are his temple in which he dwells. So we see body imagery in these passages. We are all built together into one edifice or one body, one bride. There's one vine with the branches connected to it and so forth. We see fruit-bearing imagery here. As the temple of God, we are to glorify God in our bodies. We are to offer up spiritual sacrifices, which may sound somewhat esoteric, I suppose you might say, but it's not really. He wants us to do what we're doing here and to worship Him. But He also wants us to offer Him the worship of a life that is set apart for His glory. And we see protection imagery here. He's going to guard us not only in this life, but also in the life to come. We are the Lord's temple, and He is going to work through us to glorify His name, and He's also going to keep us uh, throughout eternity. Now, fourthly, Jesus pictures our relationship to Him as a lampstand. Uh, He has set us aflame by His Word and by His Holy Spirit so that we might shine the light that he has given to us, the light of his gospel to the world. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Uh, we were talking about this this afternoon as we were going through the uh, last chapter of the, what we call the New Members book and uh, how we are to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus. Uh, the Lord has not given us the light in order to hide it under a bushel, and we often do that. When we're in conversations and we're around other people, we seem to push Jesus back into the closet and close the door so that nobody knows we're believers when we need to be bringing him out and telling others about him. That's what our Lord is telling us here. That's the work that he says we should submit to as his bride. This is what he wants to accomplish through us as his body. This is the good fruit that he wants us to to bear by abiding in him. This is what it means to follow him as sheep, to follow his example, to become like him, to be those that are light bearers that share that light. These are the spiritual sacrifices that we are to offer to him as his temple, that we be lights in this world, lights through the way we live and lights through the things that we say, the gospel, so that others might come to know him. So we are a lampstand that is to give light to the world. And then finally, Jesus pictures our relationship to him 
as a family, that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. He is our elder brother. He is the one who inherits. He's the firstborn. And we, as the children of God and as his brothers and sisters, also inherit uh, with him. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 8, verses 16 through 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Now, family suggests the idea of connection. Uh, that includes a commitment uh, to one another. As there is in marriage, I mean, a man and wife get married, they form a family. Or in a body, we're all connected together in one body. Or a vine to its branches, there's one vine and we're all members of that same vine. Or of the relationship of a shepherd to his sheep, there is connection that includes commitment. Uh, family also reminds us of the kind of love that we are to have for one another as members of the same body. But here, let's just consider this one idea of inheritance. Uh, if we are joined with the Lord Jesus Christ, which we are by grace through faith, if we're trusting in Him, then we are the children of God. And if we are God's children, then we are heirs, fellow heirs with Jesus. And that means that we get to share in what it is that Jesus receives. Now, that means two things. It means, first of all, that we share in his sufferings, okay? Paul reminded us that, that if we share in his sufferings, then we will inherit with him. Jesus suffered in this world. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. That's what happens sometimes when you bring Jesus out of the closet and you tell other people about him. They might make you suffer a little bit, uh, not like it is in some countries, although it may come to that someday, but we must be willing to suffer with him. But we also get to share in his reward, the spirit which we share in now and his kingdom, which we're a part of now, but we'll get to share with him forever. Now, that means if we're going to inherit that kingdom, first of all, that we're never going to perish, as we saw before, under the image of the shepherd and his sheep. But it also means that we will be forever with the Lord. And we get to enjoy that throughout eternity, the beatific vision, the blessing of being able to see the Savior, to be enveloped in that world of, of love with one another. We are the family of God, and that means that being a part of the family of God, we will never cease to be a part of the family of God. And what that means, too, is that we never really lose the relationship that we have with one another in Jesus Christ. When a loved one dies in the Lord Jesus, or as the Bible usually represents it, when he falls asleep, he goes to be with the Lord, she goes to be with the Lord. Or, of course, when brethren move to somewhere else in the world, we still have that relationship with them. Because we're all still united in the Lord Jesus. We're all still a part of the bride. We're all still part of the body. We're all still branches connected to the one vine. We're all still the sheep of the Good Shepherd. We're still living stones built together in that temple. We are a lampstand still shining the light together. And of course, we are related as brothers and sisters in the Lord, wherever we are. And one day, we have the promise that the Lord is going to gather us all together again. We get to see not only the people that we knew that have gone on before us, and not only those we know that are going somewhere else in the world, but even those we've never seen before. You know, some of those uh, heroes and heroines of the faith that we so much admire. So let's, through particularly this image of family, let's continue to strive to preserve that love that binds us all together. Let's pray for one another. And let's continue to work together wherever the Lord may have us for his glory and his kingdom as we all look forward to that future reunion that we're all going to share in that heavenly city that is yet ahead of us, the one that we're still on pilgrimage toward but will arrive at because of the grace of our Lord. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And
Let's ask the Lord to help us do that.